purpose of the <laughs> Okay, well, anyway, um, you know, usually you would think that you would come to a talk and uh, you would have someone who would continue on and on and on in the same tone. Uh, or you would have a bunch of slides that either made no sense or were completely useless. Um, I, I went back and forth in my head thinking, wow, do I need to do slides to kind of get this point across? Or do we need to talk about it and have fun and kind of explore it, have some discussion, figure out where we're going? Um, as most of everyone in here who actually is responsible for maintaining a system knows, and for those of you who actually care about your personal data at home, you have to back up your data. The problem with backing up data is that as hard drive capacities rise, uh, the tape capacities have not kept up at the same pace. And tapes are actually very expensive. Uh, depending on how you choose to back up, uh, I know certain people that use the same tape for years and years and years to back up. I'm like, have you ever actually recovered something from your tape? No, we've never had to. And I'm like, well, let's hope you never do. Uh, or you look at, uh, you know, so if you replace your tapes on a more regular basis, you have to spend uh, several thousand dollars, depending on what type of tape technology you're using, whether or not you are trading speed for capacity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So recently, uh, in the last couple of years, there's been uh, a trend away from tape-based backup into hard disk backup, uh, or some sort of online you know, backup storage. Uh, just as a question, how many of you in here are no longer using tapes to back up your data? Okay, so, so good. So, so we're all here to learn about uh, something a little bit different. Now, I, I don't know what different types of technologies are out there. You know, the, the downside to anything with the word enterprise in front of it is enterprise usually means dollar signs. And uh, a lot of law schools sometimes cannot afford those dollar signs. Uh, in the back, we were just talking about you know, sort of the poor man's way of doing backup. There are some now what I would call middle line types of uh, backup solutions. And then, of course, there are the high end backup solutions, which can run into several hundred thousand dollars depending on your infrastructure and everything else. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, and the cheapest way to do this type of thing is to build some sort of system with a series of hard drives, you know, commodity hard drives that you could buy uh, at uh, you know, any place uh, and to employ some sort of copying method, whether it be R-Sync, X-Copy, or what have you, to sync your data between the target and the destination. Uh, that is very inefficient. You can script it, I guess, a little bit. There's probably some uh, freeware packages and what have you that you could buy that would facilitate that process. Uh, but of course, um, that would st it depends how you look at your data, how much you want to protect your data. I know from a, my perspective that the majority of restores that we do are user error. You know, someone who's deleted a file, uh, what, even if it's a system admin, like, oh my god, I accidentally deleted this file, or I accidentally deleted that file. Uh, disaster recovery is an important part of the equation, and I think it's one of the downsides to tape is that I, you know, a, a large majority of you did not raise your hands when I asked about the tape. If I then said, okay, who never takes a tape outside the building if they do a backup? You know, that might be scary to see how many people might honestly raise their hands and say, you know, I never raise my, you know, I, I never take my tapes off site. You know, if we have a fire, oh well, I don't care, the building's gone. Uh, or look at it and say, well, you know, I try to remember every payday to, uh, to take my tapes home with me, and, but sometimes when I just found out I didn't get as much of a raise I wanted, I left the tape at work. Uh, so, you know, you have all these downsides that you can look at it and say that, uh, you, you, the honesty is you cannot, you cannot rely on the human equation. Uh, you cannot rely on it. You need to have an automated solution that you can trust to secure your data. So, you look at these different types of solutions and you say, okay, we don't have a lot of money, let's build a system, let's do that. Uh, one of the problems, though, that I, I think is that you have a reliance on the underlying file system to support the types of backup that you want to do. Uh, I'm going to go into that more when I start showing by example because uh, there's probably a few of you that might not understand how this limitation plays into a fact, and I think if I show you, it'll be uh, clearer. Uh, then you also have the midline systems. 
uh, what I consider a midline system is some company, XYZ, that did the same thing that is the free or semi-free solution, but they support it and they charge you three times as much. Uh, the benefit of that is you have a vendor to call. And a lot of us feel all comfy if we have someone we can pick up the phone and call uh, to, to uh, answer any of our questions. I don't understand how this works. I don't understand why this works, but somebody's there to help you. And that's actually not a bad idea because you can get into that price range for like ten fifteen thousand dollars, which is not a lot of money. Uh, the benefit is is that if you have another location on campus or another campus that's uh, further away from you, and you use one of these types of solutions or even the homegrown solution, you can automate your backups offsite transparently to the user. So you fit the requirements of doing your backups, and you fit your requirements of doing your backups offsite. Uh, now. We, uh, the University of Nottingham with Rutgers is what's called, uh, you know, we're a direct lending institution that has, you know, we give out student loans. And so the federal government classifies us as a bank. So we're now required to do all of these uh, federal regulations that we have to adhere to. And so some of them require these types of things. It's no longer like a, you have to have backups. It's like you have to have backups and they have to be all site. And we might come and audit you. So it's like, okay, so that was sort of the, the reason why we had to look at why we were, what we were doing before to take backups and relying on me or someone else to take them home, put them in our safe, which wasn't fireproof, uh, but it was nice and big and heavy, thick, right? So maybe it'll sustain a fire for an hour. Uh, or we had to uh, uh, you know, go this route of looking at a solution. Uh, then, besides those mid-level systems, you have what I would start to say gets into the enterprise systems of backups. And pretty much, uh, when you go out and you look at the marketplace for that, there's two, I think, dominant vendors. You have EMC and you have network clients. A lot of the vendors, uh, Dell, uh, IBM, what have you, uh, do it either their own or some sort of subset. Like, I believe Dell is EMC. It's repackaged, it says Dell, just like all their laptops are not really their machines, but they stick their name on it. Their backup types of solutions are the same thing. The downside is that you're no, no longer talking $15,000. You're now talking a solution that can cost $40,000, $50,000, $60,000, to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on how much data you have and what you want to do with it. Now, how can we afford that, right? You know, I, I couldn't possibly afford to say, okay, I have all these pieces of equipment and I want to store them everywhere else. We lucked out, however, that our main campus computing services bought the, you know, the high-end system, of the, uh, specifically the NetApp. They bought what's called a real store system and they housed that in our main campus. The price tag on that box was over six figures. We didn't have to pay anything. They needed it, they bought it, they told us, pay for the hard drives, the storage space you want to use, and we'll let you use it. So it's like, okay, great. So now we have this off-site uh, data service that is only going to cost us a few thousand dollars a year to pay for. What do we need on our end to you know, hook up and enable that capability? So we ended up purchasing one of the cheapest network appliance boxes that you can buy. Uh, NetApp is sort of funny. They sell, and SMC, uh, EMC is the same way. They sell, like, you can buy the box, and then if you want different protocols, each of those protocols are very expensive. So, NFS access to a NetApp is $7,000. SIFS access to a NetApp is like $8,000. HTTP access is $8,000, something like that. So, you quickly spend tens of thousands of dollars in software. Uh, so, you know, when you, when you look at a box and you say, wow, that box costs 50 grand, you might spend $20,000 on access protocols to that box. So there is a downside. It's very expensive, but you get some very nice benefits. Now if I can figure out what my laptop is doing, I'll, uh, I'll show you. So here I our desktop into, uh, or actually I use Microsoft's remote client, into one of our machines back at home. Uh, what we've done is, uh, does anyone in here have network appliance equipment? EMC equipment? Okay, so I don't EMC has the same type of technology. So what we've done is we've enabled uh, what's called snapshots. Uh, come on, there we go. At the uh, we have you know here's our online backup storage that's available to individuals in our building. It's designed to be self-service, so that if they go into their home directory, they get this tilde snapshot that appears. And as you can see, 
We've designed a system where it takes the last 23 hours of backups and makes them individually available to the user. So you have SV hourly zero. That's the most recent backup, and that occurred at, uh, I guess, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, you know, 10 a.m. here. SV hourly one would be the, the 10 a.m. Eastern Standard, and so on and so on. So that a faculty member could go in and recover any work within the latest hour automatically. Um, they could also go and recover the nightlies for the last seven nightlies automatically. And if we scroll all the way down here, we also had the last uh, 13, no, 12 weeks, the last 12 weeks of data online available to the user. Obviously, we can access that, but the, the individual user can access that. At any time, they can go in and recover any of their data instantaneously from their home directory. I mean, these are all available as read-only to the user. Uh, and this is what I was talking about before about the different types of file systems. I can explain if anyone wants how this works. It's actually kind of neat. Uh, but uh, so you can see right away, locally speaking, we've got online backups available to the user. So we've got our backups. We have our backup policy. This is what we back up. This is what's available. This is one part of the equation. The second part of the equation is taking this data and backing it up in real time off-site so that if we were to experience a disaster, we would not lose any of the data. What we've done is we've purchased another $8,000 add-on to the app. In case any of you are a little scared about uh, prices, first prudence being the name of our app. We bought a package called uh, Snap Vault. And what Snap Vault does is it takes our local system jurisprudence and it syncs it to NUVS. And if you look here at the time, this is actually sort of misleading, you'll see that we back up all of our data, the incremental snapshot of our data, every hour, all of a sudden. So, what's the benefit? The benefit is, is that if we sustain a major disaster, the most we would lose is one hour. Work. So, do the faculty understand exactly what we're doing here? No, because we've never had a disaster. But when I go home at night, I sleep easy. Yeah, I never worry. You know, you, I never have any mind. You know, sure, there are still concerns about hackers infiltrating the data source and everything else. So, how do we get around that? The main campus that runs NUBS does hourly nightly and a weekly snapshot of our transmission data. So all we're doing is at the top of every hour, we are syncing the remote store with what we have locally. They are then in turn taking snapshots of that data, which are available read-only to the administrator. So... Was uh, user that you're up by data on the central server? Yes, okay. central so server. This, you're not reaching out to the desktop? No, you can buy... Uh, they're, they're, they do sell, um, I think it's only a few hundred dollars. Uh, you can actually buy, that's a good question if any of you are interested. You could buy, like, and the university offered it to us as well, that for a few hundred dollars you can buy like, Windows clients and put on Windows XP. Or, or you could run right on the, the uh, if you had like a Linux workstation, they also support it on that. You could run the Snapball software locally on that platform and sync your data to the remote store as well. Uh, you could also, sync the data back to your, to your local network. You don't necessarily have to send it to uh, your, your main campus real store. So you could look at this equation as one of two ways. You don't need the $100,000 piece of equipment that our main campus has in order to facilitate this process. You can have two, two of maps with equivalent disk space and snap them that way. The benefit is that the system that they bought uses inexpensive ultra ATA hard drives, uh, whereas our local NetApp uses fiber channel. Disrupt. So you, your access times and everything else are significantly better on a local net app. Uh, but you know, for backup purposes and everything else, the ultra ATA solution is uh, sufficient. Are any of your faculty uh, aware of or they are unhappy about the idea of having the data off out of the door and you just have to computer on the main campus? No, because you know, uh, it, it, well, I've had a couple of people who are more and more paranoid faculty have said that, and I said, we well, you know they own the wire. They could sniff your traffic. Most of them understand that, or say that uh, you know 
Uh, your email, a lot of the systems are, you know, we still use central email systems, so the data are stored there and are backed up, you know, employing whatever methods they have. Yeah. Uh, you know, we did. That's how it's Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could be paranoid. I mean, there's always going to be some that are paranoid. Yeah, you know, we, we had the, uh, the one person who's really paranoid kept everything on the drive. It was really hard not to laugh when they had problems with their CD. Yeah. If you don't trust, you know, what do you can trust? Um, yeah, any issues with uh, open files and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, that, that's sort of built into the Waffle file system, which is what Network Appliance uses. Uh, to the way that it takes the snapshots is, uh, you know, it, they you only take the backups from the snapshots. So the snapshots are the, the sync in time, uh, and so the way the NFS locking works and the SIFS locking works, it, removes, it locks the file before it takes the snapshot. There are optional adding clients, as you might imagine, for Oracle, Exchange, and Domino, all of which get costs. Uh, actually, the, the single mailbox restore option for Exchange, if you want it, the last time I looked was $25,000. So, this is why I preface this with enterprise. This is not cheap stuff, but it is, you're getting what you pay for. I mean, this is leaps and bounds above and beyond what we were before in terms of our data storage and data recovery. Uh, for anyone that can afford these types of solutions, there's no going back. I mean, how much data are you replicating locally to the remote sites? Uh, well, if you look here at this display result, this tells you how much data we transferred in our last transfer, about 300 minutes. It also tells you duration, two and a half minutes. So uh, our total data usage is uh, uh, around, what, 125 gigs is what we're currently using uh, in our actual active uh, uh, volume. And then you can see our snapshots are using approximately 80 gigabytes. And what's the frequency of the replication? Every hour. Every hour. Every hour. So uh, you know, we're trans. You know, for us, the sync is you know, so it's only a few hundred megs, uh, and you know that's a significant amount of change data. But it only takes like you know, so two and a half minutes to go up over our uh, OC3 to the main campus. So it's uh, when you think about it, the peace of mind is amazing. Probably. Well, you know, when we're um, about to deploy a larger EMC box for all the servers and everything else, and the one thing that surprises a lot is how much Cisco fiber channel gear we have to buy to make it all work. Do you have to buy anything, or is it something that was provided by the university? Uh, no, I think the, the EMC stuff, when we looked at that originally, the bots, they're like, well, how much does the bots cost? They're like, oh, $12,000, $15,000. How much does it really cost? $15,000. You know, cost-wise, it was the hardest thing was to explain it to our purchasing department because when you submit a PO for fifty thousand dollars, they have to pay. It's like, whoa, you know, uh, what, what's going on? So you have to explain to them, you know, sort of what the cost is. The the for for the money, the uh, the NetApp has uh, it, it comes with some stuff like it has iSCSI built in, has two fiber channel controllers that are available externally. So that we could hook up, we could run SAN on top of this box if we so chose. Um, it has dual gigabit Ethernet interfaces built in, uh, and it has uh, you know, redundant power supplies, you know, uh, the redundant power drives, and everything else. And obviously, too, you know, each of these, like this capacity that we have here, you know, the 144 gig disks when we bought them are several thousand dollars. Uh, from you know, so depending on the capacity that you need it, you could bring the cost down significantly. If you didn't want, like we bought the HTTP protocol with the eventual plans to deploy. If we haven't done that yet, if you remove that, you could bring the price down. So you could certainly purchase this type of uh, solution if you had to do it yourself. You know, to do this type of syncing offsite, you didn't have someone else that had a box or was willing to do that type of mirroring. I think you could probably get in for about sixty-five thousand. Today we're going to look into an agreement uh, with the business school also has an EMC and it's located three months away. So, meaning that we double our capacity from four to eight terabytes, mm -hmm. they give us extra four terabytes and then we back each other up. Absolutely. If you, but if you think the central services is not offering the service at right. all. If you, the, the problem with that again is you probably get more into the issue that he raised back there, which was about having the data off site. I, I did talk to them about an encryption option, with master keys, and everything else as part of the syncing off site so that you could lock the data in. And at this time, we do not have a product available. 
So uh, the answer, I think, was pretty much that they realize it's an issue and it's coming. But uh, I think if it's, if it's available, it's probably only available to high-end customers who've got hundreds of thousands of dollars. In, you know, I mean, if you look at some of the case studies, I think it's amazing. I know how much my single piece of equipment looks. If you look at some of their case studies, you see these companies that have like 14 or 15 of these boxes, and you're thinking, well, they spent you know uh, somewhere you know $600,000, 700000 dollars for their infrastructure. Um, this kind of system talk about really, but if I do like the idea of all these aspects as opposed to you know, the daily payback that we're going to have, uh, is there some uh, formatted solution to uh, kind of maybe an hourly backup on the sand or something like that in conjunction with the well, you know, we, we talked about there. There are a lot of, uh, of you know software devices that you can buy and install on individual computers. There's some external type of solutions. One of them that comes to mind is called Mirror. It's like an external box that you put on a network, and you install client software on your machine, and it would monitor, monitor your file changes. And then every time you change a file on your local PC, it copies it transparently in the background uh, to the Mirror server. What kind of price tag are you looking at? Five hundred bucks. For that type of solution, so I mean, there's there's absolutely positively cheaper ways uh, to do this. Would I stake my department on a mirror box? Absolutely not. But for an individual user who's looking for an additional peace of mind, it's a pretty good idea. The limitations, which I briefly alluded to, was in terms of how, you, what many of you might be saying, well, how does it do these snapshots? Uh, and Ken and I talked about this, you know, previously. Is that the, the Waffle file system actually keeps it in you know, the database of items and everything else. And so at the top of the hour, all it's doing is saying, don't reuse these items. So actually, when you edit a file that exists on your file system at the top of the hour, you're not overwriting the previous file. You're creating a new file. So, so, so what I was thinking is the mirror solution along with tape might be, might be, you know, uh, if you have the reliable offset backup, but you'd also have the hour to hour and if somebody lost something. Right, but to, uh, you know, to deploy that, I think you'd be looking at, uh, you know, if you look at the amount of data we do every hour, 300 megs every hour, you know, if you were looking at, okay, we only wanted to keep one hour of backups available, then you could probably, and, you know, the, the transfer methods and everything else, like our net app is connected to our local network at gigabit speeds. So I don't know, I, I just, I would have a lot of issues with doing that, but for maybe a couple of individual users that you had concern about, definitely. Yeah, mm -hmm. most of the Snap and Mirror type servers I've seen at least advertised are really designed for Soho applications as opposed to the enterprise or even school wide. Yeah. Uh, but you know, certainly uh, for an individual user who has a concern about their data, like we've had faculty members who are doing backups at home and we've recommended to them the more paranoid ones and say, hey, you, know, you might want to look at some solution like this, which is relatively inexpensive, and would give you a much better level backup than you currently have. Uh, but the, the other thing needs to be realized is, is that too is that a lot of those types of solutions also are prone to uh, like I don't know if on the mirror box that it can do individual security permissions and everything else. I'm not really familiar with the technology, uh, you know. But I think what I, what I would like to see is sort of uh, you know, some advancements that Microsoft is making with their local file systems and perhaps changes into the Linux file systems. Or, or the file systems like you know, JFS or XFS or anything else that would support this type of database uh, item mapping. Because if they did that locally, if it became available in the native file system on the platform, you could do these types of things on your standard machine. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's patents and everything else would be lawsuits. Um, I don't know if there's, there's other ways around it. But. We're actually doing, we're beta testing something like that. One of the tests that I'm running in particular is to see if I have all of my network stores and I have to go back up my network stores, and it does. Um, basically, we have them, the event group is what, about 12 people? 20. About 20 people. We have them leave their workstations in. It, it does a backup. The full one is very long, it's about an hour and a half, and we're backing up anywhere from 10 to 50 years of data. And then the incrementals happen every night, but it's an instant restore. They can go in and decide what they want to get back or we can. Well, but again, the issue there is the same trail we were talking about before, is that the local file system does not allow for the, the type of speed that would be necessary, to, especially the prime map, because you're sending out the site. So there's just no way, I think, that you could rely on that for 
for a type for a mass wide scale of an hourly type backup solution. But, um, but only the first backup is better now. Because I got there in like three, four minutes. Yeah. Whenever they plug it online, just use them in the middle. You can get it to it's about eleven bucks a machine. It's only three or four minutes per machine. The incremental the incremental ones they happen every day. Like when I got Right, they happen at night. Right, it only it only whenever takes they log in. whenever they log in. Whenever they have an internet connection, it will do the backup behind the scenes. Okay. It takes three to four minutes for the internet and we monitor it through web. So the Iron Mountain, Mountain software then must be running in the background of the process. The right, and it's keeping track of the files that change right. so that it can in three or four minutes it can send the data. Yeah. Right. right. So you're consuming more you're, you're contributing, I think, not not potentially like for you, but you're contributing to the need to buy ever faster global computers because you, know, you have to. Somebody's got to, you know, generate that that differential list so that the data can be sent. It's, it's, it's easy to say it takes three or four minutes, but in reality, it doesn't, because you have to. The system has to know which files to send. Do you, you know, am I losing you? No. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. but it's it's a neat technology. It's only eleven dollars. You know, uh, but you're, you know, you're placing your trust in this stuff. So. Yeah. Any other? Are you, I'm wondering about the data you back up with. I guess yeah, your mountain will take your laptops. So I'm really concerned about all of our mobile users because we're stuck in the 20th century with data and all of that. Um, and we have real data. Important stuff goes on the server and the servers are taken care of. But all of our real value is in Outlook and is everything else, which is on our client machine. And we're not doing that right now. We're looking at a migration scheme that allows us to do this. Are you capturing all the we have, uh, you know, uh, obviously what we've done is we've extended that to say that uh, we provide remote access to our local file stores to people, you know, from their laptops or their desktops at home. Uh, we have a couple professors who've actually set up a you know, system Microsoft backup software to back up their local file systems for their local file sets that we specify to, uh, the, uh, to the server automate that process. Uh, one of the, I think, the downsides to keeping the data of any, every individual user, you know, whether it be an Iron Mountain or another type of service provider like that, is if you have 200 users and, uh, you know, it's expensive, it's, uh, and, and you're placing your trust in an outside vendor, uh, which, as people mentioned, a lot of people might have serious trust issues with that. I don't know, if, does the Iron Mountain encrypt any of that when it sends you? No, no, not the transfer of the data. Is the actual data encrypted on their server? When it gets back to their server, yes. And we can monitor all the web interface. You can see when the last successful backup was. What no, that's, that. that's not what I'm, at. I'm asking. I'm asking. Yes. So you're the only one who has a key to decrypt it? Yes. Okay, that's pretty good. So, any other? Are you keeping the profiles on your server? Or something like that. I'm just wondering, how do we get the teams out besides walking to the desk? Oh, well, so you know, we're running Exchange server right now. So, you know, when when our team is at the of the VPNs into our network and runs this Exchange issue. So it's not an issue with that. Um, you know, we're looking at, you know, again, for where implementation, uh, this would, would all be essentially stored anyway. So, I mean, the, the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, we, we, we don't have an interest in backing up individual users' computers. Um, we only care about the data that's on the individual machines. So we'll, we'll take steps and say we have, we have our network drive. We extend it out. They can map as a network drive securely on their machines. We say, put all your data there. So if we have to restore your machine, we just restore your machine, you know, right from our own image. We don't care about individual file settings, preferences. Um, and we're sort of taking the more corporate environment approach to that and not the, the academic approach, which is become the norm. You, know, you can customize your desktop, you can install your custom applications. You know, we've sort of taken a step back from that and said, this is what we supply, this is what we support. Uh, as long as you follow the, the way we've done it, it's a quick and easy uh, and painless. So one of the things I've learned with the secondary large hard drive and then the The newest version of Bill's saw automatically every hour and number of hours. I feel like uh, you know, off the shelf retrospect with USB drives for the you online know, maintenance users. Uh, they're running shit off the back of the or on their desktop. So that you know, running this back up to a USB. Uh, I'm looking for more of a, an institutional selection. Because uh, we're, we're going to move to something soon. And I wonder, the other question would be with uh, 
Rutgers solution, did it come from campus IT and they invited you to the solution? No, we, we, we actually went to, uh, you know, uh, the way we sort of addressed it was we were looking at buying a network appliance because we could get the types of snapshots and recoveries. And it's funny because I think Iron Mountain runs their system on that as a side thing. That's pretty neat. Uh, but uh, uh, you, know, you, you look at it and, and then we were like, well, what's going on with this? What's going on at the university? What are they doing? And they were in the middle of purchasing the system and said, and we, we engaged discussions with them. They're like, yeah, you know, we'd be willing to uh, take on additional users on this box since we spent a lot of money for it. And adding capacity at this point is inexpensive. Uh, you know, for them to support us on the cost of a few thousand dollars, so they're only willing to add a little more to that for their profit margin and uh, allow us on. A lot of the, these types of purchases were funded from the same, um, support, you know, same key base. So. But that's pretty much it because you know it's uh, I think it's pretty straightforward. If anyone wants to talk more, you know, about some of the specifics or different methodologies behind it uh, and why we looked at other places and decided you know, not to look at it, just you know, well, ask me. So thanks. <coughs>